Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning. So uh, let me introduce myself very quickly. I will not go into a very uh, in-depth introduction because I'll do that in the core session. Otherwise, it will be a boring repetition for all of you, right? So uh, my name is Sachin Rajgopalan. And uh, I'm working as an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology at Ramnara and Ria Autonomous College. OK, so uh, uh, with this, I won't invest much time in introduction here. We'll do that in the core session when all others are there with us. Uh, we will directly start with a few discussions about what we are going to learn and why we are going to learn. And maybe uh, we will start with you know the very first section that we are going to be dealing with in this unit. OK. Uh, but before that, let me clarify a few things with you. Number one is that all the reading materials will be provided to you in the form of a wiki link. What a wiki link is, you will see in the course session because I'm yet to create a wiki link for uh, the animal physiology part. But in the course session, I will show you what wiki links are and how you will be able to access it. Second is that all the presentations that I will be using will be provided to you on the wiki. OK, all recordings, that is all sessions that we are conducting will get recorded. The recordings will be provided to you. OK, it's for you to go back and refer to at any point of time. If you feel that you have some doubts or difficulties or you want to revise the concept, the recordings will be at your disposal. OK, so all these recordings will be provided to you on the wiki link. And finally, uh, not today, but from the next week, at least whenever we meet, we will have MCQ based test at the end of the session, at the end of every session. OK, now, why are we doing this? This is not going to be counted anywhere, but this is to check that how much you have been able to assimilate. It gives you an idea of what you have got out of the session. And at the same time, it gives me an idea that how much you have been able to take up out of the session. OK. So we will do that in a way that will also help you to prepare in the right way for the concepts that we are dealing with. OK, at any point of time, if you feel that you're not understanding anything, you have questions in your mind, please feel free to talk. You can unmute yourself. You can stop me at any point and you can shoot your questions. But if you feel that you don't want to unmute uh, and you are comfortable typing, Please put it in the chat box. That's also convenient. But I would prefer the first option because that keeps the session very interactive. Right? So please see to it that whenever possible, you can unmute and you can speak. Don't worry about the background noise and disturbances. We all here are adapting to this technology, this platform since a year and a half now. And we all know that what are the nuances associated with this. So don't worry about that. You can unmute. You can speak. But if you have any issues, you can also type it out in the chat box. It's completely fine. OK, no question is a chindi question. Please keep this in mind. You may think that, oh, this is so basic question. How should I ask? Maybe people will laugh at me or maybe sir will scold me. Sorry, no questions are chindi questions. Feel free to ask anything that comes to your mind. OK, I don't assure you that I will be able to answer all of those at the moment, but even if I don't know something, I will surely find that out and try to answer your questions later. Okay, because no one is perfect or no one knows everything. So I'm keeping that option open that if I am not sure about something, I will surely get back to you once I read about it. Okay, so with this, let us quickly start with our discussion. Today, I'm not going to cast a presentation. Today, it's going to be like a chalk and board session wherein I make use of a whiteboard. And uh, this is basically because we are trying to build our fundamentals. And uh, later on, if time permits and we start with our very first section, then we will have a look at you know uh, what the first topic is about in a basic image of uh, the anatomy, okay, of the first system that we will be dealing with. Okay? But that is obviously depending on how much time we have at hand and how we are planning to go about it. OK, so uh, let me quickly cast my uh, whiteboard to you guys so that we can start. OK, so I hope that you all are able to see the whiteboard. Yes. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Amazing. So I'm here to deal with a part on animal physiology, which has been titled as Animal Physiology Part 2. Now, before we dive into this, it is very important for us to understand the meaning of the term physiology. I have always seen people, even in the medical scenario, when they start with their initial studies of medicine, especially in MBBS, I've seen people always confused and they interchangeably use these terms until and unless they start their full-fledged study of anatomy and physiology. So I've seen people using these two terms, anatomy and physiology, interchangeably. But do you think this is correct? Are these two terms one and the same? Can someone tell me? Are these two terms the same? No, sir. No, right? They are not at all same, right? Anatomy basically is a completely different area where you are trying to understand the structure, okay? You are trying to analyze that what is this particular system made up of? What are its constituent elements? How is it designed? So it's more about the body architecture that you are studying there. Okay. And it has more detailing about small, small parts of that system, which may not, you know, really be uh, very significantly touched upon when we generally speak about the anatomy of any system. Like, you know, when I talk about respiratory system, someone says, yeah, I have nose, I have trachea, I have lungs. But other than the parts, the major parts, saying pharynx, larynx, or, you know, the bronchi, the uh, bronchioles, other than naming these parts, let me tell you that the anatomy of the respiratory system has a lot of different types of cartilages involved. Okay. It has a lot of different types of joints involved. It has a lot of skeletal structures involved, which we do not normally speak about when we speak about the respiratory system. We end up speaking about the major parts of the respiratory system and we finish it there. But when you are doing a proper anatomy course, you will have to go through all those skeletal features as well to understand how these different parts of respiratory system have been brought together, stitched together as one system. So anatomy becomes, you know, very, very fast. And sometimes it's considered to be very boring for a basic reason that it has lots of nomenclature, lots of terminologies to remember, and it becomes difficult. It becomes more and more difficult as you go on covering different types of systems. So itne sare naam yaad rakhna is like impossible a task. But you know, that's the reason why in MBBS course, anatomy is a feared course because you have to remember so many things and you may just end up, you know, goofing up in the paper and losing that paper completely, right? So it's very difficult, but just the architecture is not going to tell me how does that system work? What is the mechanics of that system, right? So it's like studying the parts of car, understanding what's the part of the car structurally. That's anatomy. But that's not going to tell me that what's the exact functioning mechanism of this particular system. So for that, I need a different area. What is that area? That area is what we call as physiology. So physiology tells you that what are those physiological functions that are taking place in these parts that we study in anatomy. Now, no doubt, to know physiology, to understand the functioning, Knowing the architecture is important because without the architecture, we can't bluff how the system functions, right? So I don't say that you need to know the entire anatomy with all those names and nomenclature. No, because we are not here for that. We are here to understand the functioning. So to understand the functioning, at least the outline of the structure is what I am going to be more interested in. Okay, so when you read the reference books that have been prescribed to you in your syllabus, they are vast in terms of description of the anatomy. 
but we are not going to deal with the entire anatomical section our major focus lies in understanding what are the major parts of this system and more importantly my emphasis is going to be in making you understand how does that system function okay now there are two questions here the first question here is why should i study anatomy and the second question is why should i study physiology so can you answer this question for me and tell me what do you think is the reason of making you study either anatomy or physiology what's the gain out of it anyone come on it's okay to go wrong okay it's completely fine we all are learners so don't fear just speak whatever comes in your mind it's completely okay to go wrong anyway sir it is so we can understand the organisms better and if they have some diseases then we can treat them okay very good pranav anyone else wants to add to this come on anyone whatever comes to your mind so as pranav said that our major focus here is to understand it so that if there are any diseases associated to it we can treat it but is that the sole reason is that the sole reason yes no one else okay fine no problem so when you talk about anatomy it tells you the normal architecture of the system okay so if anything is structurally wrong if anything is structurally abnormal that's going to affect the functioning of the system which is quite obvious because you know that our entire system has been made like that including the biomolecules that if the structure is lost the function is affected the best example is proteins right you say that if the structure of the protein is affected the function of the protein also gets affected so similarly if the structure of the organism the anatomical feature of the organism is affected the function that it is responsible for also may get affected so understanding the normal architecture becomes crucial okay and how that architecture is helping you to carry out a specific role also becomes significant right you take any part of your body you take for example brain now brain has been designed in such a way that it's a small part it weighs you know its size is as good uh, you know as what you call your you know double of your fist and the weight of it is around 3 to 4 kgs but can you even imagine that a part that is so low in weight as concerned with the rest of the part of our body is responsible for all the coordination that is happening in my system isn't that really amazing and the complicated structure that it has which is like a web of neurons it's a web of neuronal cells if anything happens to that web the entire system may collapse and that's the reason why whenever you have brain related surgeries where the surgery is going to have an effect on is first thought about you would have heard about this especially jinko brain tumor hota hai brain tumor ka jab case aata hai तो ब्रेन ट्यूमर कहां पर है कौन से एरिया में है ब्रेन के उस बेसिस पर वो डिसाइड करते कि सर्जरी करके इस ट्यूमर को निकालना चाहिए या नहीं निकालना चाहिए क्यों क्योंकि वो जहां प्रेजेंट है वो लोकेशन का क्या रोल है कितना सिग्निफिकेंट फंक्शंस वो लोकेशन कैरी आउट करता है इस बेसिस पर सर्जन डिसाइड करता है कि भाई सर्जरी करना चाहिए या नहीं करना चाहिए क्योंकि कई बार अगर वो आपके मोटर मूवमेंट्स को कंट्रोल करने वाला एरिया होगा तो वहां पर सर्जरी के दौरान अगर थोड़ा भी इधर उधर कुछ हो गया तुम्हारे न्यूरोनल नेटवर्क में कुछ डिस्टरबेंस हो गया दैट पर्सन मे हैव टू लीव अ वेजिटेबल लाइफ फॉर द रेस्ट ऑफ द लाइफ स्पैन देर इन मूवमेंट्स में बिकम इम्पॉसिबल सो यू नो लोकेशन आर वेरी वेरी क्रूशियल 
And this is not just with brain, it is also with other organs of our body. So understanding the anatomy, the architecture becomes very significant to correlate it with different kinds of disorders and diseases and try to understand what goes wrong when, you know, the architecture is affected in some way. Now, surely this doesn't mean that all disorders and diseases that we face is because of abnormality with the architecture. That's not true. We need to understand that even if the physiology gets affected, we are going to suffer from disorders, right? So physiology also can be related to disorders and diseases where, could, where there could be disruptions in your physiological mechanisms. So you take example of, you know, conditions like diabetes mellitus, wherein you know that there is deficiency of insulin, right? So it is responsible for maintaining sugar balance. What is it exactly affecting? It's affecting your metabolic process. We need to understand this. Unfortunately, when we diabetes, ki baat karte hai, people think that, okay, there is deficiency of insulin, uh, blood sugar level is high, so the person is suffering from diabetes. But have you thought about the symptoms that it shows? Why does that appear? And it's very interesting when you start understanding the uh, disorder from the point of view of the signs and symptoms that sh they show up. That makes you understand what is going wrong. Let me give you an example of this particular scenario of diabetes. Now, diabetes ka problem kya hai? Problem ye hai ki jabhi bhi aap khana khate ho, aapki khane mein jo bhi glucose hai, jo bhi sugar hai, wo aapki body ke har cell tak pahunchna chahi. Because we know that glucose is the major uh, respiratory substrate that our body utilizes to generate ATP molecules, to generate energy. Now, what is wrong in the process of diabetes is glucose cannot be taken up directly into the cell. Once it is in the bloodstream, the cell needs to be informed that there is glucose outside. Please take it. Now, who is that messenger? So the chemical messenger involved here is a hormone. What is that? Insulin. So insulin, which is secreted by your beta islets of Langer hands of your pancreas, they go and attach on insulin receptors which are present on every cell of our body. So it's like a doorbell. Insulin is like a doorbell. It's messaging the cell that there is glucose outside. Please take it inside. Now the question arises is, why do you need a messenger? The messenger is needed because the transporter for glucose, you need a protein, you need a transporter for taking glucose inside. That's not in the membrane always. It needs to be recruited in the membrane, which means that glucose transporters can be plugged in into the membrane and plucked out after the work is done, because that's how our cell membrane is. We call it a fluid mosaic model. It's highly flexible. You can plug in transporter proteins, you can plug them out. So glucose transporters need to be recruited in the membrane. That recruitment happens when the cell gets a message ki bahar khana hai. Bahar glucose hai. Ab ye message aate hi, transporter jaise hi recruit ho jayega, glucose will start moving inside. And once it starts moving inside, your major central metabolic pathways, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, ETC, it sets it to generate ATP molecules. Now imagine if that doorbell ringer is not there. If I don't have insulin, there's no one to inform that by there is glucose outside, take it inside. So what is the consequence of this? The consequence is that even though there is glucose, my cell is not getting it. The cell is starving. Now, once the cell starts starving, it doesn't have enough respiratory substrate. What it does is it starts sending signal to the brain. And that's the reason why a diabetic patient ends up having double their appetite. Doesn't that make sense? Because even after having food, the cells are not getting access to it. So the cell is sending message to the brain. The brain is giving you signals of hunger and the patient is having double the amount of their appetite. 
So this is the first symptom in diabetic patients, excessive consumption of food. Second, you will see that diabetic patients, they start having urinary tract infections. Why is it? Because excessive glucose in the blood is going to be recognized by liver that, oh, something is going wrong. This shouldn't be in such high concentration. Liver is a you know, part which has this task of blood purification along with kidneys. Liver ka ek kaam hota hai. Jo bhi paltu cheez hai blood mein, usko detoxify karna hai. Aur kidney ko bolna hai ki bhai ab ye sab cheezo ko bahar phe. Kidney ka kaam hai bahar phe kna. Liver ka kaam hai detoxification chalu karna. To yaha par aakar, jab liver ko samaj mein aagar, itna sugar kiyo hai yaha par? So, usko partially break karna start kar. Fully break nahi hota, partially break hota. To a ketonic form. And this ketonic form, the kidney starts excreting via urine. So, the urine sugar level, the urine ketone level increases. That's why another way of diagnosis is checking for sugars and ketones in the urine. They collect urine samples and test for it. Now, if there's going to be a lot of sugar and ketone out there, it's a feast for microorganisms. It's a feast for bacteria and fungi. So what are they going to do? They will start colonizing the urinary tract because they are going to get a lot of nutrients there. What's the consequence? Urinary tract infection. And these patients, the urine has a ketonic smell because glucose is being partially oxidized to ketonic forms and being excreted out. So their urine starts having a specific smell, which is called as ketonic smell. So see, this is how you end up linking things. And this is possible only when you understand the normal physiology. What normally kya hota hai? So you relate to what happens in normal conditions. Mein kya hota hai? And these signs or symptoms humko kyu dikhai de rahe? Are you understanding what I'm trying to say over here? Are all of you with me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Now, another small thing that I would like to add there before you know we close the diabetes discussion and we come back to it when we speak about the digestive system is about why when you know anyone wants to have a surgery kisi ko agar chota sa bhi surgery hoga you know normal very small very uh, you know not very serious kind of a surgery they make you do a blood test okay they also make you find out your sugar levels they make you find out your blood pressure levels right and until and unless these profiles are normal they are not going to take you under the knife they are not going to take you for the surgery. There's a reason for that. What is the reason? Please understand that if your blood sugar levels are high and if you are undergoing a surgery, post the surgery, your healing process will not occur easily. Why? Because healing is nothing but cell division. Cell division requires a lot of ATP. If the person is diabetic, they are not getting enough glucose because of Deficiency of insulin. If there is no enough glucose, there is no enough ATP. So, what are the chances of the operation? The operation will be successful. After that, you will have to stitch. For today, the sutures that are used to stitch for today, are called biodegradable sutures. That means, you don't need to cut the sutures with the doctor and cut the sutures with the doctor. वो ऑटोमेटिकली वहां पर डिग्रेड हो जाता है उनको हम बायोडिग्रेडेबल सूचर्स बोलते हैं अगर पेशेंट डायबिटिक है सूचर डिग्रेड हो जाएगा हीलिंग नहीं हुआ होगा वो कट ओपन हो जाएगा आर यू अंडरस्टैंडिंग द रिस्क एसोसिएटेड विद इट इट इज डिजास्ट्रस सो द डॉक्टर्स विल फर्स्ट सी टू इट दैट दे गेट द ब्लड शुगर बैक टू नॉर्मल before they actually begin with the surgery. So surgery chalu hone se pehle, they will try to get the blood sugar levels to normal. And 
and they will see to it that till the time the healing has taken place their blood sugar levels are within the limit so they will be constantly monitored otherwise it's a huge risk right so this is how understanding physiology is going to be of great help to you guys in understanding how the system functions and what goes wrong under specific circumstances so here in our unit we are going to be dealing with few systems we are going to be dealing with the respiratory system a very very interesting system though at some point becomes confusing when you start understanding the laws governing the respiratory mechanism or exchange of gases but it's quite interesting my personal favorite is always the nervous system i love neurology so uh my bend towards the nervous system is very high and uh, this also stems from my degree in psychology so nervous system is something that is always very interesting and close to heart then comes the digestive system which again is interesting but has lots and lots of names to remember lots of processes to remember but is interesting to understand what happens to the food when we consume it and finally uh, we will be discussing about the reproductive system and certain uh, processes which are associated with the reproductive system right so these are the four systems that we would be discussing in detail and we will start with the respiratory system first so when you talk about the respiratory system the most complicated in terms of the architecture and even maybe in terms of functioning is going to be the mammalian respiratory system the mammalian respiratory system has been designed in such a way in such a complicated way that it makes us appreciate that how beautifully uh, nature has done this nature is a wonderful designer and that we come to know when we study the anatomy and physiology of different organisms that we have on earth that how thoughtful the process of designing the organisms has been so you know it is very appreciable when you see the entire structure so when you talk about the mammalian respiratory system i call it as complicated because it doesn't have a single part which is responsible for just exchange of gases and get done with it no it is a very elaborate system it is the system itself is divided into two sections we have the first section which is just responsible for transporting the gases and the second system which is actually involved in the exchange process okay so the entire system itself is divided into two halves the first half is where we are dealing just with the transport mechanism and the second half is where we are dealing with the actual exchange mechanism right now let me tell you that if you see the animal kingdom if you start from phylum porifera you go to celentrata you go to stenophora you go to platyhelminths you go to askelhelminths or nematodes as you call them you go to annelids arthropods then you reach to molluscans you reach to echinoderms and finally to hemichordata and then you step into chordata you will see that every system that you study whether it's a respiratory system whether it's a digestive system whether it's a reproductive system whether it's a nervous system every system has evolved gradually if you talk about the respiratory system just from exchange of gases via mere diffusion process in poriferans to having a well developed respiratory system in mammals it has been a journey of evolution where in there have been several kind of trial and errors that the nature has tried out before coming up with a concrete uh, anatomical structure that we have today with us right so it's a beautiful journey and if you see organisms like fishes we really can't stop appreciating that how beautifully you know though complicated but how beautifully the exchange takes place because there in the gills you know it is real task for them to exchange gases because the flow of blood and the flow of water on their gills may be in the reverse direction 
So if the exchange of gases is by mere diffusion, it's not that easy process because the flow of both the liquids in which the gas exchange is happening is the opposite. Then also nature has found a way to find out how the blood can be reoriented to the flow of the blood. So how do we find this phenomenon? Is this phenomenon? So this is why I always say that people who feel that anatomy and physiology is very boring, very ridiculous, it is because of the point of view with which you look at it. You look at it from this point that how it has been designed and how it functions so seamlessly, so effortlessly, that makes us start appreciating the concept, right? So today we will start our discussion with the respiratory system. I don't know how much details we will be able to go into, but I will try to cover at least few parts of it, uh, you know, uh, before we actually end our discussion for today. Okay, so as I said, I don't have any presentations for you. It's just an image that's, uh, that, is, that is what I'm going to cast for today because uh, this is what basically we will be discussing about. So just give me a minute to share the screen. Okay, I hope you are able to see the image, right? Yes, sir. Great. Okay. So this is a very simple image. Okay, this this image I have put up just to not scare you with the uh, too many anatomical features uh, in the very first lecture. Then then you will say that this is ridiculous. So I I didn't want to scare you. That's the reason why I have tried to keep it a very simple, uh, understandable image for today. So can you tell me where does your respiratory system begin and where does it end? Anyone? Take yourselves as example and tell me where does your respiratory system begin? Where does it end? Do you want me to name you guys? I can do that. It's better that you guys unmute and speak, right? Yes, Ishan, can, can I hear your voice? Can you tell me where does the system start? Lecture on karke so kya, Ishan? Yes, Khushi, can you tell me where does the system start? Yes, so it starts from the nose. Very good. Okay, and then ends at the diaphragm. Ends at the diaphragm. Okay, good, very good, excellent. Anyone else has a different answer to where it ends? Start to take uh, nasal cavity. Anyone differs that it doesn't start at the uh, nasal cavity and somewhere else? You can defer completely. So can I try? Sir, oh, sure. Yes, Pearl. First. Sir, uh, start. It starts from breathing in and then breathing out. Okay. Uh, I didn't ask in terms of the process, but in terms of the parts. Starts from the nose and ends at the nose. Starts from the nose and ends at the nose. Okay. Very good. Prana, you were saying something. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. Okay. Great. So. Uh, unfortunately, when when we look at the respiratory system, we have this notion that, okay, starts at the nose, ends at the lungs, or ends at the diaphragm. But let me tell you that the process of respiration continues beyond the lungs. You're carrying the gases to different parts of the body, right? And those gases are coming back. Okay, the carbon dioxide is coming back, and it is being exhaled out of the nose. So if I look at the process, then it's going to start from the nose and end at the nose because breathe in and breathe out. Okay. And if I look at the anatomical features, then starts at the nose, ends at different parts of my body because every cell is carrying out respiration. Please understand that the mechanism of respiration, this is one of the basic issues that I have been trying to you know, make people understand from their lower classes that breathing and respiration are not one and the same. 
breathing is a part of respiration it's not one and the same okay breathing is a process wherein you are dealing only with what you call in your school language as inhalation and exhalation when you come to higher classes those terminologies slightly are modified to inspiration and expiration okay it's funny but that's how it is okay so breathing is just dealing with the exchange of gases with the atmosphere so whatever exchange is taking place between the atmosphere and the system is what i'm going to refer to as the process of breathing the inhalation and the exhalation process but that's not respiration respiration is much beyond this process of exchange so respiration will involve breathing because that's the very first step where my respiration process begins i have to inspire the air i have to inhale so there it begins but post that i need to understand that there are a lot of exchanges to take place the first exchange that is going to take place is at the level of atmospheric air that has reached my lungs and alveoli so there has to be exchange there i mean from the alveoli to the blood vessels because alveoli is a part of your lungs where you have a lot of blood vessels and the exchange of gases between this alveoli and blood vessels is the second exchange that i'm going to see then there is another exchange between blood and the cells of my body different cells of my body right because after the blood carries the gases up to different cells there is an exchange taking place there so that's an another exchange so the first exchange was between me and atmosphere the second exchange is between the alveoli and blood vessels yet another exchange taking place between the blood and the cells and finally inside the cells once the oxygen goes into the cell what is it doing it's breaking down complex organic molecules into simple ones that's where atp is being generated that's where carbon dioxide is being generated as a by product and that's what is what you learn in your biochemistry as your central metabolic pathway so even that becomes a part of your respiration so the mechanics of respiration is divided into four broad steps we call it as breathing where you study inspiration expiration process then you have something called as external respiration where you study about how gases get exchanged between alveoli and blood vessels then you have internal respiration where you try to understand how gases are exchanged between blood and the cells and finally you have what happens with the oxygen that has gone into the cells where you're breaking down complex molecules to simple ones generating atp generating carbon dioxide that's what you call a cellular respiration so breathing external respiration internal respiration cellular respiration this is what our focus of the human respiratory system is going to be all about as correctly said that my respiratory system begins at the nose now you need to understand that the nose is a structure which has an opening that pair of opening that you can see externally which is visible to us is what we call as external nares i'm sure you have heard this term in your 11th standard when you would have studied the human respiratory system so that's what you call as external nares and exactly above at this point i have a pair of openings which i call as internal nares so there is an opening which you can see a pair of it called external nares and there is a pair of opening at the top which is called as internal nares so you have these two sets of openings external nares and internal nares the passage between these two the gap between these two openings is what we call as the nasal chamber 
okay what do we refer to it we refer to it as the nasal chamber okay now please understand this nasal chamber is not as a single passage no okay it has been divided into two compartments okay it has been divided into two cavities a chamber ko do hisso mein baat diya gaya hai do you know what divides it does anyone remember what is that part which divides your nasal chamber into two cavities what is it called anyone sir septum mm -hmm. it's called mesethmoid okay unfortunately uh, we refer to it as septum but septum is a very general term any dividing uh, boundary is what we normally refer to as septum so it's called mesethmoid what is mesethmoid mesethmoid is a cartilage okay and that's the reason why you see see it's not a bone it's a cartilage it's not a bone please keep this in mind bone hota to ye itna flexible hota hi nahi tum naak ko chhu ke dekho it you can move it you are able to move it because it's flexible that flexibility is because it's a cartilage kai baar tumne experience kiya hoga ki jab achanak se there is a blow on your nose okay someone hits you there or you uh, you know strike yourself on your nose immediately your eyes start watering up have you experienced that i'm sure everyone would have experienced it at some point of time isn't it yes sir yes sir you know why because below this mesethmoid you have the nerve endings which sense pain so it immediately activates a lacrimal glands that's the tear glands and you start secreting out tears so we need to understand that this flexibility that you have is very significant okay that helps you in a way to breathe in and breathe out that flexibility is essential otherwise this region would have been very very rigid this is rigid to an extent but still it is flexible now in some people you would see that this cartilage keeps on growing and that starts obstructing their sinus which are empty spaces over here so it starts obstructing at this point it starts applying pressure on that sinus so they always suffer from a condition called as sinusitis inflammation of the sinus sara jo tumhara mucus hai wo wahan jama ho jata hai hamesha sardi zukam laga rehta hai because the cartilage may be growing that is one reason for sinusitis there are other reasons for sinusitis also so then they have to undergo a small surgical procedure to cut off that you know unnecessary extension of the cartilage that's taking place now please understand the cavity that has been formed the two cavities that has been formed in your nasal chamber you can divide it into three regions teen zones have जो पहला जोन है जो स्टार्टिंग जोन है तुम्हारे ओपनिंग के सामने दैट जोन इज वॉट यू कॉल एज वेस्टिब्यूल नाउ वाई डू आई कॉल इट एज वेस्टिब्यूल आई कॉल इट एज वेस्टिब्यूल बिकॉज आई विल हैव हेयर लाइक स्ट्रक्चर्स ओवर देर वेरी स्लेंडर हेयर लाइक स्ट्रक्चर्स वाई डू आई हैव इट एनी लॉजिकल रीजनिंग यू कैन रिमेंबर फ्रॉम वॉट यू हैव लर्न इन योर लोअर क्लासेस why do i have it to trap sir they are particles. yes so to trap any foreign particles that are trying to enter along with the air that you inhale you have the vestibule region there but is vestibule 100% effective no no sir no that's the reason why we are still ending up inhaling a lot of foreign particles along with the air that we take in so it's not 100% uh, effective it cannot stop particles of all sizes it has its restrictions too tiny too bigger particles can't stop that's how you end up inhaling lot of foreign agents along with the air that you take in followed by the vestibule you have a respiratory region now what's a respiratory region 
so you know to make you understand this i'm going to give you a very bizarre uh, you know concept over here but don't get uh, you know afraid of what i'm saying if you cut this area off okay if you cut this area off and you see the inner part of uh, the nasal cavity you will see a lot of blood capillaries there too many blood capillaries there why is it so that is the speciality of your respiratory ring too many blood capillaries and the reason for that is the air that you are taking in there are two things that we have to manipulate in that air number 1 it's temperature your body is being maintained at a constant temperature which is 37 degree celsius but obviously the surroundings in which you are is lower than 37 degree celsius so the temperature of the air that you are taking in has to be brought to 37 degree celsius first so when there are lot of capillaries there and lot of blood is flowing there it means lot of work is happening and when a lot of work is happening heat is generated and when heat is generated it adds warmth to the air so your the air that you are inhaling is being tried to bring about to a temperature closer to your body which is 37 so i can't say it is going to be exactly 37 no but it's going to be brought close to it otherwise your lungs are going to face a cold hit and that cold hit will be very difficult because the body will have to now struggle more to maintain homeostasis so to avoid that kind of a shock to the system this respiratory region has been designed second thing you have to add moisture to the air Now the question should be why? See how beautifully I always tell students that you know biology is a combination of chemistry, physics, and mathematics. It has zero individual existence. It's a useless subject without these three. So people who say that I love biology but I hate chemistry, physics, and maths are hypocrites. I have been those one of those hypocrites when I was a student. but later you realize that biology has zero individual existence it's physical chemical mechanisms and ultimately probability and mathematical models which you apply together that's how you know you end up uh, studying a, or designing a biological system so the air if it has less moisture its density is going to be low so what happens is the speed with which it travels in your system and reaches the alveoli is very fast now you will say what's the problem in that it's good it's not good why it's not good because dry air when it travels fast at a faster rate it goes and reaches the alveoli and hits the membrane of the alveoli and you would say animal cells have a tougher membrane so what is the problem that's not the case with alveoli alveoli ke membrane ka thickness 0.00001 mm hai which is much lesser than the membrane thickness of other parts of our cells why we will discuss that when we come to alveoli so if the air comes and hits the membrane of alveoli right it's going to rupture so what the body needs to do increase the density of the air so that it moves slow how do i do that add moisture to it where will i get moisture from again from the warmth because of the continuous blood flow through the blood vessels the heat is generated there's moisture that is generated which will make the air moist that travels into your system and finally the third top most region in your nasal cavity is going to be the olfactory zones so this is going to be where you have nerve endings of your olfactory region which is there in your temporal lobe this is the temporal lobe of the brain so here is your olfactory zone which is responsible for sensing smell so 
the nerve endings there are sensing any chemicals that might be present in the air that you inhale and the information of that is being carried in the form of a nerve impulse to your temporal lobe where it analyzes and tries to compare you know it's like a database bioinformatics agar kabhi dekha ho to tumne data already database mein store kiya hai sequence ka tum us sequence ko tumhare unknown sequence ke sath compare kar sakte ho the same cheez tumhare olfactory lobes ke sath bhi hota hai tumhare sare sense organs ke sath hota hai ki wo ye check karne ki koshish karte hai okay ऐसा सिग्नल पहले भी आया था हमने शायद ये कभी सेंस किया है इट ट्राइज टू कंपेयर एनालाइज एंड इट इज गिविंग योर रिजल्ट सी ऑल दैट हैपेंस इन सेकंड्स एंड यू कम टू नो ओके व्हाट आई एम सेंसिंग इज दिस पर्टिकुलर थिंग दिस इज द स्मेल ऑफ दिस थिंग बिकॉज व्हाट एवर यू हैव सेंस इन द पास्ट ऑल दैट इज स्टोर्ड इन योर मेमोरी वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट दैट व्हेन वी कम टू नो दिस सिस्टम दैट हाउ योर मेमोरी फंक्शंस how your sense organs function it's beautiful and that makes you appreciate your body that makes you appreciate how you are right so the olfactory nerve endings are responsible for sensing what is present in the air and then accordingly processing that information and making you realize and it all happens in fraction of seconds you don't have to think ha ye kya tha is any of you are immediately able to relate to the smell and say okay how it is even if you don't if you wouldn't have smelled it earlier but at least you are able to describe how it smells right so we have vestibule we have the respiratory region and we have the olfactory so see we ended up discussing only the nose today okay so we'll discuss the rest of the part in our next session I really hope that I have been able to generate some interest at least in you about this and I hope our future sessions will also be interactive where your interaction will increase. So I really hope that you are taking something out of this session today and uh, if you have any questions in specific you can unmute now and ask those questions. Yes Pranav you want to ask something please unmute so i did not get the name for the no septum that you said can you repeat it mesothemoid should i write it in the chat box wait okay yes sir anything else anything else that you want to know want to ask please feel free to ask So I have a very vague question here. Sure. Like uh, in yoga, when we do kapal bhati, we inhale and exhale very fast. So if it mm -hmm. is dangerous for us, then why do we do that? See, I told you that inhaling fast or exhaling fast is not dangerous. I told you that it would be dangerous when dry air passes at that rate in your system. and that's why your the nature has given you the respiratory region in the nasal cavity which adds moisture to the air so even if you are so even at that speed the moisture will be added yes indeed that's how you're designed because the blood flow is very fast see you have to understand that your breathing rate and your circulatory rate are interconnected isn't it if you end up breathing faster your circulation is happening faster right or vice versa Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So that's the beauty of how your systems are connected, and they work in a coordinated fashion. So the credit goes to here, this part, neither to the respiratory system nor to the circulatory system. The credit goes to your brain, and that to the uh, uh, hind brain part, which is responsible for controlling. So the cerebellum and the medulla oblongata part. Okay. Indeed, Pranav. So that's what I said that. इट इज तुम तुम जब एक इंजन डिजाइन करते हो ठीक है तुम जब एक इंजन डिजाइन करते हो तुम उसको एक पर्टिकुलर फंक्शनैलिटी के लिए डिजाइन करते हो कि ये कितने स्पीड पर कितने माइलेज के लिए काम कर सकता है राइट तो सेम चीज तुम्हारे सिस्टम के साथ भी है तुम्हारा भी इनहेलेशन और एक्सलेशन के स्पीड का एक लिमिटेशन है तुम उसके बियॉन्ड नहीं जा सकते हो तुम कितनी भी कोशिश करो राइट तो वो एन 
एंड लिमिट कैपेसिटी के लिए तुम्हारा सिस्टम डिजाइन है आर यू अंडरस्टैंडिंग दिस सो यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट यू आर नॉट क्रॉसिंग योर लिमिटेशन यू विल नॉट बी एबल टू डू दैट बिकॉज योर सिस्टम हैज अ स्पेसिफिक कैपेसिटी बियॉन्ड विच यू के नॉट डू सो वो कैपेसिटी हैंडल करने के लिए हमारा सिस्टम इज गुड इनफ ओके yes sir great so uh, can we stop at this point for today and we will meet in next 3 minutes for the core session is that okay because we have to switch to the another link as well